Okay, this is going to be a rather shortened version of the lecture, and a lot of the slides are the same ones that you saw in lecture. We're going to be going over the endocrine system, and if we were to break down the word endocrine, endo meaning inside and crine, crine meaning secretion. So these are things being secreted, usually through the bloodstream. So the endocrine system consists of, most importantly, the hypothalamus and the pituitary glands. They're going to be the ones that are going to be controlling the rest of the hormones in the body. But there's also other glands we're going to cover like the thyroid gland, um, a little bit of the kidney, we're going to cover the ovaries, testes, pancreas, and the adrenal glands which sit on top of the kidneys. Oh, and then the pineal gland in the brain. So we're skipping some, like the heart. And the heart is, you know, does have an endocrine function. It does produce a hormone. Um, but we'll cover that when we get to the chapter on the heart. So hormones are essentially chemicals that are going to affect an area somewhere else in the body. But how does a particular hormone affect the target cell or wherever the area is that it's supposed to affect? Well, because the cells, the target cells, are the ones that have the receptors for that particular hormone. And as I wrote here, a target cell could have anywhere from a couple thousand up to 10,000 receptors. And cells can upregulate or downregulate their receptors, meaning that, you know, in the case of upregulation, they can increase their receptors to make the cell more sensitive to a hormone. So for example, if there was, if you had a low level of a certain hormone, the cells would increase their receptors so that they would be better at taking in that hormone. Alternatively, downregulation is a de decrease in receptors and it makes the hormone, I mean it makes the cell less sensitive to the hormone. So to give you an example of that, RU486, which is like the morning after pill, I believe, it blocks receptors for progesterone. And that, you know, so in, in, in essence, it, it's preparing the uterine lining for implantation. So if you block those receptors, or if you cause downregulation, you can, you know, you can uh, prevent implantation of the um, uter of the embryo. So s most hormones circulate in the bloodstream, and so simply enough, we call those circulating hormones, right? So they're released by one cell, they go into the bloodstream, and they end up at another cell at some point away from the releasing cell, and they're taking in. Some hormones are local hormones and we've we've divided those into paracrine para meaning nearby and autocrine meaning the self same so some cells actually release a hormone and the same cell takes it back in like the heart for example the heart makes a hormone that affects the heart and we'll get to that when we get to the chapter on um, on the heart so paracrine cells release a hormone and it, the target cell is rather close by and those usually happen through ducts, not the bloodstream. So there's different classes of hormones and the implication of this is how they're transported into the blood and more importantly how they affect the cell, how they cause the cell to change its behavior. So I wrote down the two classes of hormones here, the water-soluble and the lipid-soluble hormones. So under water-soluble, you have amine hormones, which are made by decarboxylating amino acids. So you take the carboxyl group off the amino acid and you leave the amino group on. So an example of that would be a group of hormones called catecholamines, which we will um, we'll get to that. It's, it's in essentially epinephrine or adrenaline and a couple of other hormones. 
You have peptide and protein hormones. They're made from anywhere from like three up to about 200 amino acids. And then you have a group called icosanoid hormones made from arachidonic acid. Then you have the lipid soluble hormones. Essentially steroid and thyroid hormones. And nitric oxide is, although it's a neurotransmitter, it's also a hormone, but we don't really discuss it too much in this class. But more importantly, let's talk about how they transport through the blood. Let me move back one slide. Water soluble hormones, water is, I mean, blood is water soluble. So water soluble hormones are going to be able to travel easily through the blood, water and water. Lipid soluble hormones, however, are going to have a harder time because, you know, blood is water based and the lipid soluble hormones are lipid based. So it's like oil and water don't mix. So lipid soluble hormones have to ride on the back of a protein. So there's usually a transport protein whose job is, is to take that hormone to its target cell. Now, how they affect the cell once they're inside are quite different. So this here is a um, <coughs> lipid soluble hormone. And in this photo, this little wrench looking blue thing is the transport protein. And then this green part right here is the hormone. So the water soluble hormone, although it does have to trans, I mean the lipid soluble hormone, although it does have to use a transport protein, it's able to enter this cell quite easily because this cell membrane here is made from a phospholipid bilayer. So it's actually made from lipids itself. So the lipid soluble hormone is able to go through, diffuse into this cell, this lipid, through this lipid bilayer and go into the cell. So what you see number two here is you see how it talks about altering gene expression. So it goes into the cell, goes into the nucleus, and it changes, alters gene expression. So it's essentially turning genes on or off. And then the new DNA is going to make a new protein, which is going to change the behavior of the cell. It's going to make the cell act different. It's going to make it do something that it did not do before, or it's going to make the cell stop doing something that it was doing. All right, so the, the, at, the, at the end of it, you want the behavior of the cell to change. You want the cell to do something different. That's the idea of a, pro, of a, a hormone. Okay, so that is lipid soluble. The water soluble hormones are, as you see, a lot more complicated. So there's no problem with the water soluble hormone as far as traveling through the bloodstream. But once it gets to this phospholipid bilayer, this is lipid based. So the water soluble hormone will not be able to go through it. So it attach once it hits the receptor that's on the that's embedded in the cell membrane here, that activates this G protein, which is right on the other side of the receptor. And then it's a kind of a cascade of events. That G protein in turn is going to activate this enzyme called adenylate cyclase. And how do you know something is always an enzyme? Because it ends with ASE. So adenylate cyclase, what is the job of adenylate cyclase? Well, it takes ATP and turns it into something called cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is also known as the second messenger. So the first messenger is like the hormone itself. The second messenger, or what we call the second messenger, is cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinases. So again, ASE is another type of enzyme. So protein kinases now become activated. Activated protein kinases phosphorylate other enzymes. So what does that mean? Phosphorylate means to give energy to. It energizes other enzymes. So protein kinases energize other enzymes that are hanging out in here, which enzymes? Don't know. It's, you know, it's whatever the cell is going to do. It, d it depends on the cell, right? So it's any enzymes. But the point is, once the other enzymes in the cell are phosphorylated or they get energy, these different enzymes are going to be the thing that 
causes the, a different physiological response. It's going to make the cell change its behavior, in other words. It's going to make the cell stop doing something that it was doing or start doing something that it was not doing before. So that's kind of what number five is saying. Millions of phosphorylated enzymes catalyze reactions. You know, enzymes, just to review, enzymes speed up chemical reactions. You don't grow hair, you don't break down food, you don't make anything without an enzyme, without many enzymes. Not only do enzymes speed up reactions, but they speed things up in your body millions and millions of times faster. So practically speaking, enzymes make things happen. Without enzymes, you can't break down your food. Without enzymes, you can't make muscle, you can't produce antibodies, you can't do anything. You can't do anything without enzymes. So by activating enzymes, you can make your body do different things. So what exactly this cell is doing, it depends on the cell, right? That's not what's important. What's important here is how is this cell changing its behavior? How is this water-soluble hormone changing the cell's behavior? By ultimately giving energy to other enzymes. So, going back to going back to this one, you know, this lipid soluble hormone is changing the cell's activity by changing the genetic expression, by turning genes on and off, essentially changing the DNA. The water soluble hormone is going to change the enzymes, it's going to activate enzymes that are going to change the behavior of the cell. In both cases, the cell's behavior is changing. Just how? That's the difference. So that's why it's going to be one of the test questions I'm going to ask you about. Okay, and then the next thing is we need to talk about the anterior and posterior pituitary. So we'll start with the anterior because the anterior is um, a little more complicated. If you look at the posterior right here, you see that there's only two hormones involved here. All right, so we're going to tackle the anterior first because there's there are seven hormones. There's actually one missing here, which is going to be a MSH, and I'm going to hit that on the next slide. But this chart right here, you know, keep it as a general reference because this covers almost all of the hormones that we're going to deal with and it also mentions the target organs here and then the function so it's kind of a useful chart that that actually somebody made for me a student made so I included it in here so before we get to the hormones of the pituitary gland let's talk about how hormones interact with each other and there's three ways as you see in some cases you need the permission of one hormone before the other one can start working and that's kind of a, your body's way of um, you know keeping from doing something that it doesn't need to do like for example milk production with with milk production you have you know you have more than one hormone involved and you need really the permission of another hormone before you can start you know there's one hormone that produces milk but there's going to be another hormone that's going to be responsible for actually injecting the milk into the duct Antagonistic is just what you think. To antagonize is to go against. And so, you know, regulatory hormones, like you have hormones that regulate blood sugar. Well, you could say that those are antagonistic hormones. One raises blood sugar and one lowers blood sugar. So you have like insulin and glucagon, for example. And we're going to talk about those two hormones. And then finally, you have synergistic hormones. You know, they work together. Okay, so these are the cells, five cells of the anterior pituitary gland. From this slide, I'm going to draw the last question. So the anterior pituitary gland controls a lot of different other glands. And these are the cells of them. And you see they all end in troph. And troph or tropic means to influence a cell somewhere else to influence something away so we'll start with somatotrophs 
And somato means growth, or somatic implies growth. So you have somatotrophs, and they make human growth hormone, HGH, small h. So all the hormones, as you see, they're all abbreviated, and it's perfectly fine, actually preferable, when you write these hormones out, just to write the letters. But I would like you to know what they stand for. So somatotrophs, HGH, human growth hormone, thyrotrophs, thyroid stimulating hormone pretty much tells you what it does it's a hormone that stimulates the thyroid lactotroph lacto so milk production right prolactin prolactin is going to cause milk production gonadotrophs make two hormones and both of those the word gonad is going to tell you it's going to the target cells are in the testes or the ovaries so you have follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone and both of them go to the testes and the ovaries and they have different functions in, in, in each and the last one is corticotroph so cortico we're talking about steroids here so the first one is adenocorticotrophin hormone ACTH and the target cell for that is your adrenal glands which are above your kidneys and then you have melanocyte stimulating hormone which there's not too much known about it but it's it comes from the pineal gland and it's thought to I don't know the best research says that it influences like um, skin pigmentation like moles things like that freckles it's thought to also influence like circadian rhythms you know like 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 how you know it's nighttime if you can't see outside or it's thought to help with sleep anyway um, that's not gonna one one that I'm gonna hit on a lot these right here that I'm circling right now are all of the hormones that are released from the hypothalamus. So remember, the hypothalamus, and I'm just putting an H here for hypothalamus, the hypothalamus controls the anterior pituitary. And I'm doing this with my right hand and I'm left-handed. So. so the hypothalamus controls the anterior pituitary. How? By releasing hormones. So the hypothalamus makes a releasing hormone that causes the anterior pituitary to make its hormone. So if you look at all of these, they all end in RH. All of them. So RH stands for releasing hormone. So the names actually start to become kind of easy. Although it doesn't seem like that now to you. It is. Growth hormone, releasing hormone. That's going to cause the release of human growth hormone. Thyrotropin releasing hormone. Prolactin releasing hormone. What does it cause release of? Prolactin. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. Right? So you see gonadotropin, gonadotrophs. So gonadotropin releasing hormone, it's twice here. And then here you have corticotropin releasing hormone. Right? So these are the releasing hormones. To stop the secretion of these hormones, there's two choices negative feedback or you can the, the hypothalamus will make an inhibiting hormone and only two of these use inhibiting hormones and that's one I'm going to try to and again I'm trying to do this with my right hand PIH prolactin inhibiting hormone which is also known as dopamine and right here growth hormone inhibiting hormone, GHIH, which is also known as somatostatin. So these two, GHIH and PIH, are both inhibiting hormones. The rest of these use negative feedback, meaning that once there's no need for the hormone, the whole cycle stops. Once there's no need for thyroid hormones, there's no more need to stimulate the thyroid. So you don't need thyroid stimulating hormone if the thyroid's doing its job. All right, so that's negative feedback. All right, so from there you should have the majority, that's pretty much all of the uh, material that could be on the quiz. So good luck.